Darkness often feels safer because darkness is the fortress where you may be hiding your deepest wounds. Welcome to the way of light. Light. Have in the past so much feared what people would think of me. I am a pastor. We exist to engage Christians in their faith and mobilize them to be light. The longer we stay in the dark, the greater the darkness grows. We hope you would be challenged and inspired to know Jesus more deeply. deeply. Trust God to be in control of your mind and be filled with his spirit. And invite and others, invite others to, do the same. to do the same. I am going to get real with you today. A tagline that I shared in a previous episode that really just defines the importance and the significance of walking in the way of light and and what leads to it. So how can we find the way of light? I believe that transparency is the gateway to the way of light. I actually hope today to be transparent with you. This has really become a, a place for me to just allow God to speak not only through me, but I would actually, I would actually petition to say that maybe God has spoken more to me than He has to you in the preparation for this process. Not in a in a higher level sort of way, but just that uh, I'm not just sharing things I've perfected. I'm really sharing things I'm in the process of becoming, and and so in that process, I hope that 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 as I'm sharing through transparency and the things that God is teaching me, I hope that. That on this journey together, you'll be able to glean from some of these lessons that God's been uh, really beginning to to settle in my heart today. Today's a heavy one, and uh, I know I tend to fall on the heavier and more um, deep thinking side anyway. But today is a heavy one, and and I'll just tell you right now that if you are not in the mood for depth. Uh, come on back a different day. I want you to listen to this episode, but I don't want you to just listen uh, out of obligation or feeling like you've got to listen to an episode titled having to do with something so deep and significant. Um, but I really believe that this is something that God is stirring in me and and for the sake of helping to stir in you. Second Corinthians chapter 1 has brought me great encouragement in my life as, as Paul brings up God as the source of all comfort. And as the source of all comfort, he comforts those who are troubled so that we can comfort others when they experience similar kinds of trouble. And so my hope is to share not only the depths, but also the comforts that God has led me through and and begun restoring my soul and renewing my strength in certain ways. And I hope to be able to to share some of those experiences with you today. And today I want to talk about depression. I want to talk about the depth of what it can feel like to be caught in a hole, feeling alone, feeling uh, like nobody understands you, and and really talking about it. I, I Talking about it from the perspective of a pastor I, I've been hesitant to really lean into that aspect because, yes, I, I'm a pastor at my church, uh, a youth pastor at my church, and and oftentimes there is this stigma for years that, n- for, for starters, if you're a Christian, if you're a follower of Jesus, if you experience some level of depression or anxiety or uh, even just the stirring in your soul of uneasiness and uh, I've heard it expressed from John Mark Comer and John Tyson that that there's experiences and seasons in life where we just walk through what some would call the dark night of the soul, where it's just, I, I feel so much pain internally, and I cannot begin to express those things in ways that make sense for many others. But maybe you're listening, and you'll be able to uh, find that you, you're able to relate in some ways. I just want to start really by just kind of setting this up really where I, I first began to experience uh, these levels of depths. And I also understand and want to be aware that there are different types of depression and experiences that some will go through. There are some that are much more 
chemical that you might experience a chemical type of depression or a reason for it that's more uh, physiological rather than psychological uh, as the as the root cause. And then there are some where it's just you may uh, experience post traumatic stress and you've seen something and and it's it's caused you to feel a certain way down the road and. And I don't want to begin comparing one to another. I just want to be honest and sharing my own experiences with you today. So I, I remember it was um, it was back in 2015. I've shared back in my origin story episode about how my dad had a stroke in 2015, and then he ended up passing away in 2017 and just being able to share how God used those things to instill in me a faith that I didn't know was possible to have until until experiencing all that stuff with my dad. And um and so from there he so he passed away on on March March 15th of 2017 and so actually today the day this episode comes out marks 7 years since losing my dad and the odd thing is if you've lost someone close to you especially at a younger age you might be able to relate to this every year about this week this time becomes a time where I experience severe lows that I don't know how to define or explain or let other people in on. Um, and and so I, I I remember, so that, that was, that's what's happening currently in my life is I'm kind of going through those things and I'll talk about it a little bit more later on. But, but I also want to share the first time I really remember, I'm sure there was other times, but I remember really experiencing a low, like I've never experienced before. I was uh, a youth pastor in Central Oregon, and uh, I, I was working part-time at the church. And so I left the church after everyone was gone, and it had been a great season of ministry. Our youth ministry had been growing and thriving. But internally, I was not. I was seeing the the incredible fruit of what God was doing in the church, but inside I still felt so empty. And I remember that day I was supposed to meet my wife and my the rest of my family over at my mom's house for dinner. And I, I left the church building, I got in my car, and I, I turned it on, and, and I just was about to head there, and I just broke down and wept. And I don't know what came over me, but it's like the weights that I've been feeling all of a sudden just all came down all at one time. So I I didn't know what I was going to do, but I, I texted my wife and just said, Hey, I I can't come. I need to go for a drive. I threw my phone in the back and I headed in the exact opposite direction as my mom's house. And I just drove and I didn't know where I was going or what I was doing. And to be totally honest, I could hardly see the road. And again, the fact that I was a, I was working in ministry and there was incredible fruit to think that I experienced this depth or this weight of emotion that I couldn't, I couldn't explain was kind of embarrassing. And I didn't tell anybody. I didn't call anybody. I didn't ask for help. I just felt alone. I felt like I had to figure this out all by myself or someone might look up, someone might not look up to me in the same way as their pastor or leader. And it was just so, I was so lost. And so I drove and I drove and, and I passed outside of town and I was approaching this train track intersection and I saw a train coming and, and, and what I felt in that moment was just hopelessness. Like I was done. And as I wept, I thought to myself, this would just be so much easier if I didn't have to feel anything at all. So I stepped on the gas and I drove as fast as I could to try and make it to the train tracks in time so that I could just hopefully stop feeling. And it didn't take long before I I had this security and confidence come over me that I believe was the Holy Spirit, the power of God speaking into my heart and just speaking these words. Zach, It's not your time yet. And that gave me all that I needed, just enough to hit the brakes and let that train pass by. 
I was ready to be done. And as I watched the train passing in front of me, I continued to weep and just pray for a way out. And I didn't know why I felt this way. It, I knew that this had come after I lost my dad. And I, I was looking through journals trying to figure out the time, but I don't know that I wrote it down. And I would imagine it was about a year after losing my dad. So this took place in about 2017. But it's not your time yet. Those words continued to ring over and over again in my mind. And then in early 2021, I was seeing a counselor in Oklahoma who helped me draw back on some memories of losing my dad. And uh, here's some of the words and things that I felt in that therapy session was that I just, I began to realize again through weeping how much I felt alone. And it's not that there weren't people in my life who cared. I had some close friends and, um, and, and a job that I loved, but I felt alone and I actually felt abandoned. Now it wasn't my dad's fault. He was sick. Everything took place that was not like he had no part in causing the things that caused his death. But I felt abandoned. Where's my dad? I needed him. I'm 18, 19, 20 years old, and I feel alone. I felt like a hole in my life had been, had been exposed, and I needed a male influence, someone to take me under their wing. And I just felt like, how come nobody has... How come nobody has stepped in yet? Like so many people cared about my dad and he cared about so many men and yet nobody made, made an effort. And so I just felt like, like alone, abandoned. I felt like nobody cared enough to step in to my life and take on that role. And yet I'm sure there were people, I just was probably blind to it. But I also, of all of these feelings the word that resonated the most for me was that I felt numb. I felt numb. In a time where emotion seemed so prevalent, like I just had all of these hurts inside, I felt numb. I couldn't feel much of anything. Like I knew what I wanted to feel and I kind of knew where some of the emotion was stemming from. But when my therapist looked at me and just said, you know, you know why when things are numb, it's often intentional. And in the medical field, at least, and it reminded me of when I was younger, my dad would go to remove warts off of my legs or something like that. And, or when I went to go get stitches, what, what did they do beforehand? They numbed the area that they were going to, to, that they were going to work on. The same thing when I had teeth pulled. If you ever had your wisdom teeth pulled, you had your mouth numbed, so you couldn't feel anything. Why? so that you couldn't feel the pain. Isn't that why, like, isn't that why sometimes it just feels easier to shut down so that you don't have to feel anything? I, 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 sometimes I feel like this is a cop-out response when I'm feeling depressed, especially in the week leading up to March 15th every year, where I just, I feel that memory of my dad and feeling that hole in my life and feeling like I'm, I'm not good enough on my own or nobody's taken me under their wing, which is, which is actually, um, started to take place more in the last couple of years. I've, I've, but I, mainly because I had to realize that I couldn't keep waiting for someone to come to me. I had to understand that I also had a responsibility to go and ask for help. So I started to do that. Um, but last year, uh, back in 2023, March 15th, they, we had an open casket funeral at our church and it stirred up some incredibly difficult feelings. And then this year, just a week ago, one week, like less than a week from the time I'm recording this, but one week from the day this comes out on my dad's seven year mark, we had another open casket funeral at the church and God helped me grow so much in empathy for the family who lost someone because the family I love so dearly, like this family is incredible. They've been such an encouragement to me over the last year or two of ministry here. And, and for them to lose a family member was so hard for them. And, and so God gave me the strength that I needed in those moments, but, but even surrounding that and the rest of the week, the numbness was creeping in again. And 
And I didn't, I, I couldn't explain why. Like, I, I haven't been there for my wife this week. I haven't been totally present with my daughter. Today feels like the first day that I'm finally coming back. But I, it, it's been a process to get there because the depths that I've, in fact, some may not, some may have a hard time understanding what this feels like. And I'm so thankful that that depression and the depth of emotion like this is not something that all of you have experienced, but this is important nonetheless for you to understand because I can guarantee there are multiple people in your life, whether you know it or not, who have experienced something like this, this level of depression. And, and so I just want to try to describe some of these things and, and, and a couple of ways that I would describe it. My brain was shutting down in ways I couldn't process the pain that I was feeling emotionally. I had little to no interest in things that would normally excite me. I love my job, and yet I would show up and, and feel like I wanted to do nothing. I love going on adventures with my daughter, and yet I had no motivation to leave the house. I love playing board games with my wife, and yet I didn't want to be close to her. I would forget things that were important. I was letting people down. I was supposed to meet up with a guy I've been so excited to try and get together with because he seems like the kind of person that we would get along really, really well. We were supposed to go hang out and go play some pool. And, and I just, I got so caught up in, in writing, actually writing this talk, um, at least some, the initial talk, I've changed it a lot, that I just didn't show up. And 45 minutes after, I was reminded that I missed it. And I felt horrible. And I felt so lame and useless. And then I was self-defeating and deprecating again. And luckily able to move out of it a little bit faster this time. Because every time, the Lord makes me stronger and strengthens me in my weakness. These are moments of feeling hopeless. Like, what's the point of trying at home or at work? Because I feel like I always fail. Well, if you haven't experienced this, for me, this is, if you're a deep feeler, like me, um, or you know someone who's a deep feeler, what tends to happen is we can have one, two, maybe three days, even a week of a depth that feels so low, it feels hopeless and out of control. We're powerless, and depressed, and numb. And even though it's only been a few days, it feels like it's been months. And then I could have had the best three months of my life prior to three days of depression. And that three days overwhelms every possible feeling of joy and goodness from things that happened prior. And I hate that that happens, but it's just, it's part of that routine. So if I could come up with an, an analogy to, sum, to summarize this, as I was on my way to work this morning, just praying about this and trying to understand, God, help me see what this is like. I'll share an analogy that came to mind for me. And then even right before recording, reading in Psalm 69 and, and the example David gives. But the analogy that came to mind for me this morning is picture yourself waking up in a dark and unfamiliar room. You might be on your own bed, but everything else is strange to you. It's so dark in the room that you can't see anything. All you know is that you're laying in bed, you've opened your eyes, and above you and on you and within you is the darkness of the room that's more than, uh, more than a contrast in the room, but actually filling you and weighing you down. It's like a weighted blanket of darkness. And it feels impossible to get up. Partly because I, I feel like I don't know where I am. It's a dark place and I don't know where to go. And I have nowhere to, if I, if I wanted to escape and walk out the door, I don't even know where to start. And then I gain an awareness that there's a flashlight next to my bed and I could grab it and I could shine it around the room and try to discover my way out, but I'm too scared. In that moment, it feels like nothing can help what I'm feeling and nothing can help me out. Even though I know God's truth in the moment, it's like, okay, I feel trapped. But in this dark room, I lay in the bed, I look up at the darkness weighing down on me and feel like I have no strength to go anywhere. And finally, if I have the strength even to sit up, I sit up on the edge of the bed and I realize, okay, there's a flashlight there and I have a choice. I can grab the flashlight, I can reach out and I can use it to spotlight my way out. I can find one of two things. 
I can find the light switch to turn on every light in the room so I'd know exactly where I am and where to go. Or I could just use that light to scan around the room and find the door. And that door I know is my way of escape. I know it's my way out. And yet I'm too completely covered in the feeling of hopelessness that I don't like I can't get up. But even as I gain the strength to grab the light, shine it around the room and find this light switch or the doorway, guess what I choose? More often than not, I end up choosing the door. Why? Because the door is my way of escape. And so I find the door with the flashlight uh, choosing not to acknowledge anything else in this room caked in darkness. And I open the door handle and I walk out and I shut the door behind me until the next time that I wake up. And I'm back in that room again. Why don't we hit the light switch? And this analogy is powerful for me as God was helping me see the clarity of what I've been experiencing and feeling because I often choose to avoid the light switch because I don't want to see what else is in the room. Because what else is in that room are things that have caused me pain in my life. There are wounds that I'm terrified of being exposed. There is temptations There's routines, there's poor decisions, probably scattered all around the walls, pictures of things in my past that I refuse to acknowledge because it feels too painful to go there. The way that David said it in Psalm chapter 69, I'll read the first two verses and then verses 14 through 15, and he says this. I'll just hear the desperation in his voice. Don't miss this. Save me, oh God. For the floodwaters are up to my neck. Deeper and deeper, I sink into the mire. And the mire is, it's not only, it's a mud, it's a swampy area, but it's also defined on dictionary.com as a situation or a state of difficulty, distress, or embarrassment. It's hard to, to get yourself out of. And it's similar, it's mud and and swamp in the original language. But he said, deeper and deeper, I sink into the mire. I can't find a foothold. David's saying, there's nowhere to put my feet. I'm sinking and there's nowhere to find a foothold. I'm in deep water, David says. I'm in deep water and the floods overwhelm me. I'm exhausted from crying for help in my throat is parched. My eyes are swollen with weeping, waiting for my God to help me. That's verses one through three. And then he continues, and I'll continue in verses, verse 14. He says, rescue me from the mud. Don't let me sink any deeper. Save me from those who hate me and pull me from these deep waters. Don't let the floods overwhelm me or the deep waters swallow me or the pit of death devour me. Listen to the cry of help from David to God in authentic misery. Like deep waters surrounding him. I'm just imagining sinking down with weights on my feet. Deeper and deeper into water or mud, a swamp, something of gross, smelly weights surrounding me and unable to breathe and yet crying out for help. And it's like God doesn't hear. Have you ever felt that way? Have you ever felt like no matter what you do or how often you cry out to God for help, it just feels like he's not hearing you? I know I have, and it's painful. But going back to, as we combine these two analogies, what what is it? Because David, he doesn't describe that his arms were chained, just says he's sinking. And it might be in like, just imagine Princess Bride, if you've ever seen the old movie, and Uh, And they're walking through the forest, and I can't even remember the name of the forest, but I know that there's these massive rats chasing them around. There's like fire spouts from the ground. And then they hit this, Will hits this deep 
sand pit and starts sinking in, or his his girlfriend did, the princess does. She falls first, and he dives in with a, a vine after her and pulls her out. And maybe that, maybe that's more of what David felt like. But here's what I have come to understand. For some reason, darkness feels infinitely safer than light. And I don't have every full understanding and answer here. And and let me be clear, I don't have the degree in psychology to really diagnose these things. And I this is a very personal journey for me. But I believe that that darkness just feels safer sometimes. Why? Why does darkness feel so much safer? I think darkness, darkness is often the fortress where I hide my deepest wounds. And maybe the true, maybe that's true for you. Maybe darkness is the fortress where you hide your deepest wounds. And because in the dark, I don't have to face the very things which cause me pain. In the dark, I'm protected from embarrassment and rejection. Well, let's consider for a minute our natural response to fight and flight, fight versus flight. If you've heard this before, when faced with pain or fear, opposition of any, any kind, we tend to either run away and avoid the pain or tackle it head on in a potentially harmful way. There is a third response that we might experience, however, Captured brilliantly in Andy Kolber's book called Try Softer. Highly recommend this book, Try Softer, one of the greatest books I read last year. The alternative cognitive response shared by Andy is to freeze, fight, flight, or freeze. A place we may find ourselves when we feel so overwhelmed and overstimulated. Overwhelmed and overstimulated. Some of you might be in that place. You might feel overwhelmed and overstimulated that we literally just don't do anything about the obvious problems right in front of us. That's what I, why do I do that? I don't do anything about the obvious problem. And I might even have a way out. I have a light that I'm capable of shining to find my way out. And it's not just me, though. Because maybe there's someone else around you that you can ask for help to grab that light and help light your way out. And yet, we're just frozen. Here's another way that I might summarize the freeze response. You might feel just like David did in Psalm 69, feeling like deep waters are closing in all around you. An escape feels nearly impossible. Hopelessness is often the precursor to cognitive emotional numbing. Numbness is the deep cognitive denial of a wound's existence. You have wounds. We all have wounds. We've all experienced something or another that has caused us pain, whether you grew up in a healthy, strong household or you grew up in a very painful, dark, and broken family. We all have wounds within us, and numbness is the deep cognitive denial of a wound's existence. Hear me out. When you are emotionally numb, your mental emotional response may have been to freeze, whether intentionally or unintentionally. I often find myself regrettably frozen for fear of exposure because I have in the past so much feared what people would think of me. I am a pastor. And as a pastor, I should be I should be like the most spiritual and close to God and have all the strength and resources I need and have every Bible verse memorized and know exactly what to say in times of pain. Because the reality is God has gifted me with the ability to help others in their own pain and help bring encouragement, light, and life in their darkness. And yet when it's my own inner darkness, all of a sudden it's like I'm frozen and I don't know what to do. Thankfully, I have some close friendships that I've been able to invite into these places of darkness, but I think there's some definite reasons why darkness feels safer, because when darkness feels safer, darkness feels safer because we don't have to be exposed. But the reality is, when darkness feels safer, your wounds become greater. When darkness feels safer, your wounds become greater. 
the longer we stay in the dark, the greater the darkness grows. Why do we stay so long? Because it feels safer. But when darkness feels safer, your wounds become greater. Get out of the dark. And if you don't know how to do it by yourself, then don't. Don't do it by yourself anymore. A truth I've come to understand is that the longer that the lights are out, the heavier the darkness. Again, I cannot repeat it enough. When darkness feels safer, your wounds become greater. So don't sit in the darkness. I understand there are moments we have to experience grief. Grief is a healthy processing, a healthy way to process loss, regardless of what kind of loss it is. But when darkness feels safer, your wounds become greater. And the longer the lights are out, the heavier the darkness becomes. So is there a resolution to all of these things? To the moments of depression, depth, and pain that we experience? I wish that I had a really easy answer for you. But the reality is that for me and for quite likely you as well, when we experience depths in our emotions that feel impossible to escape, oftentimes in those moments, God longs for us to trust him so that we could grow in our character. First Peter talks about how we experience trials of many kinds, but trials produce endurance and perseverance, character. So allow God to produce those things in you in those moments. And when you feel the depths of those emotions, don't beat yourself up for it. Stop feeling like you're broken and worthless because you feel pain. God has given you emotions to help understand more of his heart. And allow yourself to feel what you're feeling in those moments. Resist acting, acting out of depression or fear. But trust that God is strong enough to walk you through what you feel. And your feelings don't scare God. David proves that. Like I just read one chapter, part of one chapter, go through and read so many of the prayers and Psalms and just hear the the cry of desperation for healing and wholeness. I also want to specify, again, don't do this alone. Ask for help. I have a friend that I call most often. He, um, he is my longest time friend. His name's Levi. And Levi has been that person for me that I've been able to go to most frequently and with anything. He knows the deepest parts of my soul. And quite, quite honestly, um, he, he knows more about my emotional turmoil and pains than anybody else, including my wife. Why? Because I, there are certain things I cannot pour everything on my spouse. And I want to encourage you of the same. There are people you need to have in your life. You need to be able to talk to your spouse. Like my wife knows that I struggled. I told her that I've been having a hard time this week as well. But, but the depth of being able to have a friend, guys to guys, girls to girls, that you can just be totally transparent with because transparency is the gateway to the way of light. You want to walk in light, then you have to be, you have to allow transparency to be a lifestyle you embrace. Talk to someone about what you're experiencing and allow them in. Ask them to pray with you. Why is it for me as a pastor, just just very transparently, it is so hard for me to ask for people to pray for me. Like just because it makes me feel like I'm weak, which is it, so not true. I'm just letting you in on the, on the thoughts that I have. I'm, tr- I'm practicing being transparent. I want to show you that it's possible. But I feel insecure asking for prayer. But it's in the moments, um, I, I came out of a really stressful season last year, the end of last year, and I started to experience these intense, paralyzing migraines that I'd never experienced in my life. The first time it happened, my vision started to blur. I couldn't see clearly. I forgot the names of the people I worked with temporarily. And I, the, one of the guys that I worked with drove me to the emergency room because I didn't know what else to do. And uh, they were like, no, nothing's wrong. They took a CAT scan, EKG, every blood test they could think of. Nothing's wrong. I'm totally fine. And so I go and um, 
I go get an MRI and there's nothing, nothing wrong with my brain. I go to an eye doctor. There's nothing wrong with my eyes. I got perfect 2020 vision. But in all of those things within all that. So I had this, I had this twice a week for three weeks, just intense paralyzing pain laid me out in bed for four to six hours. I got like TMI, but I got a shot. I got a couple shots in the butt because the pain was so severe. That was the only medicine that would work. And this was in December, November and December of 2023. And just like finally desperate enough to invite someone into my pain. We're at a prayer night with some of our high school students on December 20th. December 18th was, uh, I had an incredibly massive migraine. And, and then the 20th, we got together for prayer and worship and just a time with high schoolers and some leaders. And I just, I saw everyone around the room. I led them all to pray with one another and it was powerful. Students on sitting on the floor praying with their hands on each other's shoulders, like interceding for each other, leaders praying for leaders and for students. And I realized I found myself standing in the back of the room with a microphone in my hand waiting for the moment to transition. And I, had, I was the only one who hadn't asked someone to pray for me. So I felt that and I turned to Matt, who's one of our volunteers, an incredible man of God, who's just awesome and believes in the power of prayer. And I asked if he would pray for me and pray that God would take away these migraines. And, and he did. And I'm so thankful and continuously praise God because I cannot express the level of pain. And I just feel like through that time and without going into all the details of what God taught me through scripture and Mark 9, and read Mark 9 and maybe you catch what I caught, but I just hear God speaking. And I realized that what I was experiencing was far more than just, it, this was not a physical manifestation of, of, of like a sickness. This was a physical manifestation of, of spiritual war. And I don't want to just say that lightly. I believe that through what I was experiencing at that point in the year, like I was coming out of it and finally like just the stress added up. And because of all the lows, I just realized like I, what I needed was not a medical solution but a spiritual conclusion and that I needed to ask for prayer, that I needed to be transparent and ask for help to invite someone else into my pain and ask for their prayer. And not every moment that we pray for things like that, do we find healing. And there's been many other things that I've prayed for that I've not seen healing. This was just a testament and testimony to God's power and his goodness and how God knew that I needed to hear that this wasn't just a physical problem, this was a spiritual one. So what is it that you're experiencing? Or what is it your family member or a friend that you know is experiencing? There's a, there's a statement that, that I have been working on repeating that um, found big healing and, and started to come out of my low state this week as I consider my dad's seven-year mark from losing him. And I find that when I'm depressed and when I'm in the depths, I'm the most susceptible to temptation. And I'm the weakest in those moments, specifically with food. And I just will eat until I feel sick, but then also uh, lust as a temptation. And, um, and in experiencing those things, I just know that I need help. But I want, even in the depths of depression, I want to be reminded of who God is and who he's made me to be and the spirit that lives within me. And so from Romans 8 and 2 Timothy 1, there's a statement that I've been memorizing just to allow God to renew my mind. And it goes like this. I believe the same is true for you as a follower of Jesus. I have been given a spirit of power, love, and self-discipline. I trust the spirit of God to control my mind. I'm filled with his spirit to make right choices and walk on level ground. If you also find yourself weak in moments of whether it's depression or you found yourself sick, or maybe you keep turning to the wrong things, maybe your worry is a continuous thought on your mind. Worry is wherever we worry the most often indicates where we trust God the least. I have been given a power, a spirit of power. I want you, I want you to actually repeat this after me or say it with me if you're in a place that it's appropriate and believe that this is true for you as well. 
I have been given a spirit of power, love, and self-discipline. I trust the Spirit of God to control my mind. I am filled with His Spirit to make right choices and walk on level ground. There are so many directions that I could have gone in this talk. And there's so much that I wish that I could have covered. We'll talk about it more later in the year about what it looks like to navigate low seasons of depression or you might feel insecure or you just might feel like you don't have what it takes to get out of the season you're in. Remember what David experienced. Read Psalm 69. And let that be maybe even a starting point. Read Psalm 69 and then 70 and then 71 and continue to read about what God did in David's life and invite God to do something similar in yours. You have been created by God for good works that he knew far before the world was created. You are worth far more than you think you are. You are capable of significantly more than you think that you are because God's given you a spirit of power, love, and self-discipline. So now trust God to be in control of your mind and be filled with his spirit to make right choices. Be honest, be transparent, because transparency is the gateway to the way of life. And remember that darkness often feels safer because darkness is the fortress where you may be hiding your deepest wounds. What are you hiding? Bring somebody in. Because when darkness feels safer, your wounds become greater. Don't stay in the dark anymore. Let light shine on those dark corners in your mind, in your heart, because the longer that the lights are out, the heavier the darkness. Do not allow the enemy to cover you in the weights of darkness that were intended for him. Trust in Jesus. Let his strength be enough for you because his strength is made perfect in your weakness.